morning, angels. It's Warwick here from Retro QTV. And listen, I am super excited because we are about to recap and review what is without a doubt the most iconic episode of Charlie's Angels from his entire five season run. Now, can you guess what it is? Yeah, I know the video title gave it away. It is Angels in Chains. So sit tight, we're gonna be right back. Now, filming this has been an absolute journey. I have, this is like third time now. Uh, first time, half the, the, the footage was blurred. Second time, I nailed it, but I forgot to plug the microphone in. So yeah, third time is a charm. So, you know, wish me luck. All right, let's dive right in. There are alarm bells ringing, there's sirens wailing, the dog's barking, and of course, there is one poor girl running for her life. She clambers over the fence, you know, none too gracefully, but then, you know, I suppose elegant dismounts aren't on the top of your list when you've just busted out the cool house. Now, I don't know, for a high security facility or even a low security one, that fence sure looks remarkably easy to climb. I mean, a chain link fence? I mean, where's the brick walls? Where's the, where's the razor wire? It's more difficult to sneak past your parents to meet that boyfriend they forbid you to see than it is to escape from this prison. Now, instead of running, the dumb girl picks absolutely the worst place to hide. And of course, it's not long before she's discovered by the guards and their sniffer dogs, and they ain't too friendly. So instead of a return ticket back to her cell, she's getting a one-way ticket to the pearly gates. Now, we're back at the Townsend Agency, and looky here, the Angel's client is none other than Julie McCoy, cruise director of the Pacific Princess, aka, you know, the love boat. Turns out Julie's sister Elizabeth was on a backpacking trip near Pine Parish, Louisiana, where she was arrested for drugs, but, you know, Julie smells a rat. No trial. Um, the prison spins her some yarn that Elizabeth is holed up in solitary, and now her letters are being marked return to centre. And on top of that, the prison now says uh, Elizabeth was paroled and she's MIA. But of course, you know, we know what happened. So because Julie keeps getting the runaround, she hires the angels to find her missing sister, but you know, from the inside. So it is road trip time, and here we are, angels in Louisiana in Sabrina's car. I mean, it's like a 27 hour nonstop drive to you know, Louisiana. Why didn't they just fly and buy or rent a car on arrival? You know, time was of the essence. Now, of course, the holiday is ruined faster than you can say plot hole by cigar chomping sheriff who pulls the angels over for a string of offenses, speeding, hitchhiking, and drug possession. Do not pass go, do not collect $100. It is off to prison for our angels. Now, lucky for them, they have a friend on the inside in the form of Dan Winston. And the way the angels are kind of pinning their hopes on Dan as their lifeline, you know, if, if trouble finds them, makes me think he's not long for this earth. We'll see. Now, they're welcomed by a guard who orders the girls to strip down to their birthday suits, and Max, I mean, I mean Maxine, has her eye on Jill. Okay, girls, strip down to your birthday suits. In front of him? Behind the partition of your modest dearie. Shower scene! Take your time, ladies. You know, it's a prison, not a spa. <laughs> Maxine gets her thrills by dousing the girls in Lysol and Kelly cracks a joke, but Maxine is not in the mood. How long has it been since you've been sprayed? Get cute in here, and you can get hurt. <laughs> Kelly is funny. Jack and Smith is funny. I've said it before, and I will say it again, and I stand by it. Now, Max gives out the uniforms, and the girls do their very best private Benjamin. What if they don't fit? <laughs> they ooh and ah over some fashions hanging on a nearby rack, but Max lets them know that the fresh meat get the uniform, see, not the pret-a-porte. And then we meet another inmate in Kim Bassinger. This is like before they were famous. Now, the early bit gets a worm, so uh, we learn work detail starts at 5 a.m., but, you know, Bree Sweetcakes Duncan needs her beauty sleep, and I says, you know, she can get a wake-up call for 10 a.m., you know, maybe a croissant, maybe an orange juice to the newspaper for sure. <laughs> anyway, the guard reminds her who's boss. Dumb move, Brie, but listen, your cover as a smart mouth troublemaker has definitely been established. And then we're on to Act 2, or is it Act 3? Not sure, but the angels head out to the field for... I'm not sure what, because there's no crops. Sleazy guard gives Kelly the once-over, and she catches him, which, I mean, the look on her face is priceless as she kind of, like, does up another button. I mean, clearly she's ready for a shower already, and the day hasn't even begun. After deep potatoes, Brie learns that a pair of gloves cost 20 bucks, so, you know, her manicure is going to be ruined, and Jill applies her usual heavy hand to some nosy questions about Elizabeth. I mean, this girl has no tact or subtlety whatsoever. Even when warned about being a busybody, she steamrolls along with nosy question number two. But she does learn that Elizabeth took a one-way trip to the infirmary and then gets a warning about being a snitch. Now, Kelly and Kim have a kiki, and Kelly learns that the cocktail dresses are for the parties at the big house before she's busted for talking by the sleazy guard and warned about the importance of manners, young lady. She lets him know that she's open to a little private chat, you know, about prison etiquette, and Kim warns her that he is a dangerous prevert and was the last person to see Elizabeth. Now, you know, no shit, Sherlock. You know, there's nothing remotely subtle about the villainous characters in this episode. So let's have a little run through of this cast of villains. Who have we met? We've met the uh, cigar-jumping corrupt hillbilly sheriff. We've met the frustrated, thirsty lesbian prison guard. We've met the guard 
guard that's, you know, open to a little bribery and corruption. We've met the sleazy rapist prison guard. I mean, where have all the good men gone? Where are all the gods? And you can tell a well a woman by the way she wears her hair. Can we just take a moment for Jacqueline Smith? She looks stunning in this scene, just beautifully lit and just all around gorgeous. Now, is this a prison canteen or a sizzler, you know, like... Pour me a glass of Pinot Grigio, ladies. Now the girls are connecting the dots, although you don't have to be mental to spot the bad guys here. That car was following me around, foaming at the mouth all day. They had to keep him on a leash. Now all roads lead to the infirmary, so they hatch a plan to poke around in there to see what they can find out. Jill fakes food poisoning and then Warden Sorensen steps in and says uh, to Jill, get to the doctor. While she's been carted away, the warden shoots a breeze with Sabrina and Kelly and she hints a little more trouble for the angels during their unfortunate incarceration. See, if they don't start cooperating. Turns out the warden's in on the act, dun, 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 surprise, surprise, because she and the sheriff are catching up on his fact checking on the girls. So far their stories add up and you know, might be good candidates for the house. Jill gets the old clear and while Max shows the doctor out, she starts snooping around and confirms that Elizabeth was in the infirmary, but she signed in. However, she did not sign out and they are a stickler for the rules, so something is up. Now, maybe the doctor should have checked Jill's attitude as well as her temperature. But look, hey, the day is not a total loss. The angels get an invitation to a party and they get to play dress up in some fancy clothes. So the prison ain't all that bad. Oh, and quite an elegant party it is too. Cocktails and horses duvers and oh, 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 oh no, Sabrina. White shoes with a red dress at an evening affair and after Labor Day? No, ma'am. And then Kelly says something about a skydiving without a parachute. And I wonder if that was just a little nod to the bionic woman or, you know, just a coincidence. Mm -mm. No worse than skydiving without a parachute. And then there's a warden sitting on her lounge like she's Belle Watling from Gone with the Wind. Turns out it wasn't food poisoning that Jill's allergic to, you know, just an allergy to hard work and I feel you, Jill. Same. <laughs> oh no, it, it was an allergy. I'm allergic to working in potato fields. Now the warden agrees the girls shouldn't have to toil in them fields and lets them know if they scratch her back, she'll scratch theirs. Although I think I'd use potatoes over prostitution any day. Anyway, Jill convinces a trick to spill some secrets before he passes out, namely that uh, Elizabeth had been smacked around and escaped and he saw Carl and a bunch of guards chase after her with guns and dogs. So of course Jill races to call Deputy Dan with the news and is busted by the cigar chomping sheriff who lets her know that Dan has resigned permanently. See how Todd's days are numbered. Which means the angels are on their own and of course no one is buying their flimsy excuses when the warden asks them about all that snooping around they've been doing. Subtlety has never been part of their um, skill set. <laughs> now clearly they know too much so the warden orders the sheriff to take care of it and you know we know what that means. So the next day the angels are escorted by the sheriff and Carl to the middle of nowhere to be executed. You know, and they're doing their best to keep their spirits up. I mean, blue skies, it's a beautiful day. <laughs> now, I'm a bit confused. Are, are they sheriffs or prison guards or both? Do they do double duty in Parish County? Listen, I sure hope they're claiming some overtime for all these evil wrongdoings that they're, they're, they're tackling. Now, Sabrina decides it'd be a great idea to choke the sheriff and the deputy while they're driving a moving vehicle and not wearing seatbelts. And they call her the smart one. <laughs> so on three, the angels wrap their chains around the bad guy's throats. And after a short little struggle, the police car veers off the road. Thankfully, not a broken bone or hair out of place. And the angels make like a banana and split before the, you know, sheriffs regain consciousness. Which way? This way. This way. Wait. Does anybody remember those vintage spinny yo-yos? Oh my God, I love them so much. Doing around the worlds and walking the dog. And do you have to go for something like 50 bucks on eBay? God, I wish I'd kept all my childhood toys. Well, actually, I wish I'd never used and kept in mint condition my childhood toys. Uh, release the hounds. The angels are on the run and the music reminds us we're supposed to be down by the bayou, not in the Burbank Hills. The angels discover a truck, but they enjoy it finding it is short-lived because, you know, ain't got no wheels. But they do find a bolt cutter and a gas pump conveniently, near, uh, conveniently, conveniently even, nearby to throw the dogs off the scent. Did you catch that? Gosh, Sabrina has great hand-eye coordination. She's got the bucket in her left hand. She's pumping the gas with her right hand. I have her on my team any day. Now, as luck would have it, they find the potato truck, but this time it's got keys and all four wheels. So they make a break for it with Brie behind the wheel. And I mean, she was a racetrack driver only three episodes ago in Hellride, so it makes complete sense. And again, no seatbelts, ladies. I mean, that's dangerous. Like, click, clack, front and back. For a brief minute, Brie looks like she is having the time of her life. I mean, Brie, you ain't go-karting. You know, you're running from evil cops. Now, Jill and Kelly throw some potatoes at the pursuers who eventually veer off the road and it promptly explodes into flames. I mean, what? That's like a ditch. You know, not a ravine. But anyway, at least with the cops out of the way, the angels can take the scenic route home. Now, back in the office and the angels are nursing their bruises, but nothing a soak in a tub can't fix. They did such a great job that Charlie decides he wants them to check out another prison, but Jill suggests, you know, maybe he should take this one. 
don't you check into this one yourself, Charlie. I mean, after all, women's prisons are filled with women. She ain't wrong. Happy ending. Half the prisoners are released. The warden and powers are locked up. Charlie tears up Julie McCoy's check. Yet another case the angels do for free. And Kim is a new receptionist. You know, we never see her again. So I guess she only takes union jobs. And that's a wrap. I mean, what did you think of Angels in Chains? Let me know in the comments. I would love to get your thoughts on this episode. Now, I hadn't seen this in like maybe 15 years. And I did remember it fondly. I really did. But I'm re-watching it. I didn't enjoy it as much as I'd hoped. I mean, it's full of cliches and stereotypes, sure. But, you know, they've come a little bit more problematic through a 2020 lens. You know, the girls chained together, chased by, you know, sleazy sheriff and his bumping deputy, the human trafficking, the evil gay lesbian. And on and on it goes. And while I do enjoy the repartee between the angels, don't get me wrong there, um, there's definitely some clever dialogue. The plot is definitely paint by numbers. And I don't know if it's aged terribly well. It's camp, but maybe not camp enough to make it a classic. For another Angel episode behind bars, check out Caged Angel. That's when Chris goes undercover as a prisoner and you know she's forced to join a gang of jewel thieves. There's definitely some cliches and you know, still some problems, don't get me wrong, but it is played for drama and there are some frightening scenes that peel away Chris's tough detective exterior and you're revealing her breaking down under the realities of incarceration. It's, 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 it's a much more and very rare character-driven study. Cheryl Ladd nails it. And I think I might prefer it to this. We'll see when we get to that episode. It's a long way off though. Uh, and it was fab to see Kim Bessinger and Lauren Tweez before they were breakout stars. And Lauren would come back uh, three or four years later for the season four opener, which crossed over with The Love Boat and introduced Tiffany Wells. So look, that's a wrap. Let me know in the comments what you think of Charlie's Angels. What do you think of this episode? What do you think of season one? What do you think of the actresses? I want to get your thoughts. And oh, and by the way, I don't know if you can see this. This shirt, I designed it myself. Uh, it features all six angels and you can grab it at my Redbubble store at bit.ly slash RetroQTV. You can grab it on a t-shirt, a mask, cushions, prints, and a whole lot more. Now, next time we see each other, I promise it won't be so long. It will be for season one, episode five, Target Angels. So look, until then, bye angels. Bye.